Let's read the Psalm 13 together. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? You see the sadness already from first verse. How long, he repeats himself twice in this very first verse. How long will you hide your face from me? Verse 2, continuing the same passionate desire in his heart, questioning in his heart, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Continuing, he says this, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Verse 3, consider and answer me, O God, O Lord, my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. In verses one and two, the question comes again and again, four times. And in scripture, whenever you see things repeated, it's because of the not only the, the desire to emphasize it, but to show the depth of the significance of it. Four times he's crying out of this broken heart, this wounded soul, this downcast mind, how long, O Lord, how long? This phrase, how long, O Lord, is spoken over 60 times in scripture. It's repeated in many books from the first to the last, and it speaks of the multitudes of struggling saints. And maybe you find yourself in that condition today where you're asking, how long, O Lord, will this pain in my body be? How long will this broken relationship be? How long will my financial situation be in this dire straits? How long will I find depression uh, affecting my mind? How long will it be till I find once again that joy that I once walked in? How how long, Lord, until the, the call of God on my life becomes a reality? These are questions that are so pertinent to the hour and the day which we live in, so pertinent to your own personal life and your family life. David says, how long will you forget me? And and then he asks, will you forget me forever? That word in Hebrew there uh, uh, speaks of two different types. One is the eternality of that word and the utterness of that word. One speaks of length and the other speaks of death. When he's saying, you have forgotten me forever, that word forever speaks of how long will you continue to forget me? I know I've been forgotten, but how long will I be in this forgotten state? It's One thing to be forgotten for a day. If Joseph, when he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and he was thrown in prison, if he was there for a day or even a week, maybe he wouldn't feel forgotten or abandoned, but month after month, season after season, and even when the hope of him uh, telling a dream, interpreting a dream, and he reminds the one he interpreted the dream, uh, tell the Pharaoh that I'm the one who did this so they can come get me out, and he is forgotten once again. Genesis chapter 40, verse 23, actually uses the word. He was forgotten. And, and many of us feel that way at certain times. We pray and feel forgotten. We, we get counsel, but feel forgotten. We, we have sleepless nights, feel forgotten. And day after day, this same sense, the, the eternality of it, the length of it seems eternal. And it's utter, it's the, the utter depth of it is, is, brings distress to the soul. And this may be the saddest question in the Bible, Will you forget me utterly and eternally? Am I lost to the presence of God? We see this time and time again in in our culture and the reality of things that happen relationally. It could be that something as simple as that child that's waiting for the mother or father to pick them up after school and the the mother forgot to pick him up. The dad got delayed at work and distracted and, and forgot, oh, I was supposed to pick up my son today. And, and that sense of sitting on that stoop and all the other kids are gone and it's maybe getting dark and you're still there. It's that sense of being forgotten. Or maybe it's a divorced child whose father no longer shows up after promising him to take him fishing. And, and the father just, just time and time again makes a promise but doesn't keep. And that child feels forgotten and feels uh, abandoned. The, maybe it's the wife whose husband has either physically abandoned her and left or, or emotionally has abandoned her. And he comes home from work and he flops in front of the TV screen on the couch and drinks a beer and eats his chips and just doesn't, doesn't speak to you anymore and you feel forgotten and abandoned. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's even something as deep as, a, as you know that you were abandoned at childhood. Uh, the, 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 the story of those who leave a, a, an orphan baby at the doorsteps of a Catholic charity, a, 
uh, mm-hmm. uh, maybe it's something as simple as you walk into a party and, and no one says hello to you or uh, you can't find conversation. You're like the wallflower and you feel forgotten and alone. This is actually a, a deeper question that we're asking is, is how long will I be forgotten? It's when will I be loved? It's a question, will anybody really care for me? Am I all alone? Am I abandoned? Why, why, why is no one ever there for me? Why, why am I no one's favorite? Why am, I, why am I not the apple of the eye of someone who I delight in, who would in return delight in me? Reading a, a, a letter recently and it said this, uh, very simple, very strange, but, but very true to many people's lives. It just simply said, I, I need a hug. Not any hug. I want a long lasting hug. I want someone to, 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 to get a hold of me and hug me. I want to be hugged so tight until I forget the sad things in my life. I want to cry on the chest of another person without being asked any questions. I need a hug that the other person can understand my pain. I need a hug. I need someone to tell me that I'll be okay, that it will be okay, that makes me forget everything I'm thinking about and all the sadness in my life. I desperately need that hug. Someone else wrote a letter and said, I feel so lonely. I try to reach out to people and, and, and stay social, but, uh, but, but no one reaches back out to me. Even my parents, I can't seem, they can't seem to bother to give me a return call. Last week, I called to ask if they could get together in, over the next few weeks, and all the answer I got was, I'll check my schedule. To feel forgotten reveals a, a longing to be loved. But I want to say something to you that I think you might not have ever heard before. This desire to not be forgotten, this desire to have a sense of belonging, it's not an evil thing. It's not something you've done wrong in most cases, but rather it reveals a passionate heart to love and to be loved. It, it, it reveals your God-given created nature that he created you to be in community, to be connected. So this longing and this cry when it's missing, how long, Lord, is not a cry of a person who has a lack of faith or who has doubt, who, who has no ability to be faithful in relationship with other people. It shows a person, rather, who has a strong passion for a relationship. I, I want to say to you, in, in some senses, pat yourself on the back. And when you look in the mirror, just say, uh, I may feel lonely right now. I may feel abandoned right now. But I feel these things because... I feel these things. I feel passionate about wanting these things. If you didn't feel passionate about it, if you didn't care, if you had a laissez-faire attitude about it, like, ah, I'm fine being alone. I'll just watch another, I'll, I'll binge another television show on my couch. If that is your attitude, it shows something more dangerous than even being presently alone, being presently forgotten. It shows your heart has become calloused, maybe even a heart of stone, and only the Holy Spirit can wake you up now and say, I can change that heart if you so desire and let you have that longing once again. Because oftentimes it's longings that bring us into the things that we desire. It's the longing first and then the reality through the grace of God. Sadly for David, he's asking these questions, how long, how long, how long? And he not only asks the question, how long will you forget me? But the second question he asks is, how long will you hide your face from me? It's one thing to be randomly forgotten or maybe unintentionally forgotten, but it's something worse when someone actually hides their face from you. The picture here is you're walking down a corridor and, and you see a friend and a smile comes to your face, but you see this strange look on their face. They look down or look to the side and maybe dart into a hallway. They're avoiding you. And wh- what does that cause you to think? Uh, I'm unwanted. I'm, there's something wrong with me. There's, there, this, this person despises me. This person wants to run, hide from me. The, the problem with David here is, is this is not a person. This is how he's feeling about God. Do you ever feel that way? That God has abandoned you? That God has forgotten you? That God maybe somehow despises you? Maybe that you're so bad, you've done so wrong, your history is so poor, your your, your background is is so troubled that, that God sees you and he turns his face from you? No, he loves you. Even while you were his enemy, even while you were in sin, he loved you. And he gave himself for you and he wants to be near to you. But sometimes we don't feel it. Even though he has not turned his face from us, we feel it that way. And David's feeling this because of the situations, the situation in his life. Charles H. Spurgeon said, a hidden face is no sign of a forgetful heart. I love that. When God seems to be hiding his face, he's certainly not hiding 
his faithful heart. He's, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have a forgetful heart. And, and another phrase is this, gold which is long in the fire comes out more purified. Sometimes when we're asking this question, how long, how long, how long? It's a purifying work. It's, it's establishing our passions and our desires. It's showing us what is as a core value in our life, a must have in our life, if you will. And, 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 and he, but, but David is feeling this. He, he, he's feeling troubled over all these circumstances in his life. His third how long then is in verse two. How long must I take counsel in my soul? Oftentimes when you feel forgotten, when you feel abandoned, when you feel someone or God has turned his face from you, you feel your only option then is turn to your own counsel. And this is a very dangerous thing. David is falling into a trap, so to speak. He's, he, he's saying, I, I have to figure out my own problems. I have to work out my own th- situations. And it may s- seem reasonable to you. It may seem the only way to go. It may seem like uh, I have to work these things out in my own strength. There is another way. Later on, when we get into the 16th chapter of Psalm, we'll, we'll, we'll study this. And in verse 7, it says, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, my heart also instructs me. When, when, when we have this confidence in the Lord, there may be, uh, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. We know there's going to be a morning, a, an awakening of his presence, of his felt presence, even though his real presence is with all of his children at all the time. But when we feel the lack of it, oftentimes we look to our own resources, our own strength. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out my future. I'll figure out how to solve my marriage problems. I'll figure out how to raise my children in my own strength. I'll figure out how to get a promotion on my job. I, I'll figure out how to get rid of my depression. I'll figure out how to, how to get rid of this nagging uh, habitual pattern of sin. I'll, I'll take counsel in my own soul. And the result of this is very sad. There, uh, John Calvin defines the word counsel here as worry, the, the Hebrew word meaning I'm worrying in my own soul. And he writes, especially upon seeing that, that, uh, that they are destitute of all resources, they torment themselves greatly and are distracted by a multitude of thoughts and in great dangers, anxiety and fear compel themselves to change the purposes, their own purposes time after time. Their own purposes, they're trying to change things by worrying by because they feel so troubled by multitude of, of thoughts there's there's sorrow and and so there's a sense of I must take control myself I, I, I must I, I must do these things in my own strength the result of that Spurgeon says is devices become innumerable but unavailing the the, the thoughtful ways of escaping the sense of being abandoned and alone they become innumerable but none of them prevail none of them work out the things that God alone can work out. We do what I call spawning a multitude of carnal fleshly ideas to solve our problems when it is God alone who gives us the power to see things transformed and made new. And I wonder if it's his taking counsel in his own soul that may be the reason that he felt forgotten in the first place. Now, the way the text is laid out, it's the forgottenness first, then he takes counsel. But oftentimes that can be the reverse. I'm taking so much counsel in my own soul I feel forgotten by the Lord because I'm not actually calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm actually the one doing the forgetting. Maybe God is saying about me, how long, O O, O son, how long until you come into my presence, till you get rid of that sense of your own counsel is sufficient and you trust in me. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge the Lord and, 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 and he will give you his understanding. He will give you something that you don't have in your own strength. That's what God wants to do. And he says, the next part of that, verse 2, and have sorrow in my heart all the day long. Do you see what he's saying here? It's, it's, it's when I begin to get consumed in my own counsel, what, fa- what, what follows is not peace and joy and solutions. My own counsel, my own wisdom, without the wisdom of God, ends up causing sorrow in my heart, despair, because my own counsel doesn't work. My own plotting and plans don't work. They are contrary to the wisdom of God. And so he finds himself in a place of saying, I have sorrow in my heart all the day long. He's sensing this abandonment and this forgottenness. And it's like 24-7. I'm just constantly in this place of sorrow. And you may find yourself in that place today. 
and, and I pray that the rest of this message, I hope you'll listen to the rest of this. Not, don't turn this off because you're about to see what God has done for you, what God can do for you, what place he has for you in being free from this sense of being abandoned, free from this sense of being unworthy to, be, uh, 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 to receive any love from God or others. There's something that, pow there's powerful uh, solutions in God's heart. Rather than the next thing that he says is that, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? This, this enemy could be nationally, as we th see things in America, uh, politically and academically and in our schools and in our family life. Nationally, we see a spiritual declension that is unlike anything I've seen in, in, in decades of pastoral care and ministry. Psalm 12, 8, one of the translations says that these people freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. When what is vile is honored, people uh, who don't have a heart after God, they, they strut about, they, 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 they parade about, they they protest things that are pure and they rejoice over things that are vile. They want to pass laws and legislations that promote horrible things even being done to children and, and some of the hormone changes and, and uh, surgical procedures to try to supposedly turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man, which is impossible. God created chromosomes, he created DNA. One scientist says almost every cell in the body shouts out, male or female, even scientifically exploring that. And, and so we see nationally this degradation, this sexual perversion, and, and, and we could be crying out, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget us? Or, or maybe it's not nationally, maybe it's relationally, something more close to home. A, a, a spouse has abandoned you, or maybe they're abusive towards you, or, or a boss constantly overlooks you. Relationally, you, you don't feel connected to your church or your community, and you're feeling alone. This is like your enemies are just being exalted over you. But I would suggest to you it is possible that David's despairing soul was that the greatest enemy he felt over, exalting over him was his own soul, was his own troubled soul, was his own heart. What, what, what is this great enemy? It's this, this sense, this nagging sense that I have to take counsel in my own strength to, to solve my own problems of being forgotten and abandoned by God. It's up to me, it's up to me, it's up to me. And that enemy is, is such a haunting enemy that gets into your soul, gets into your mind, and it becomes almost like a self-abuse where you're, where you're wounding yourself by the words you say over yourself, the beliefs you have over yourself, the beliefs you have over God, the beliefs you have over the body of Christ, and, and there becomes accusations even. There's enemies around you. This is taken up in, in verse 4. Uh, I'm going to skip verse 3 for just a moment. In verse 4, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. I'm shaken by all these things. In other words, I'm about ready to give up my faith. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I might go back to the old way of living. I, I might say this is too hard because I feel like I'm doing it on my own. I'm in my own counsel. Uh, it, uh, Psalms 30 verse 6 and 7 says, in my prosperity, I said, I will never be shaken. Oh, but now he sees something else. You know, when things are going good, you'll, you make the promise that I'll never be shaken. But when the old temptations come back, when, when fears and doubts and concerns and circumstantial problems and relational problems. And when you see the condition of the nation and can see the condition of the church, you might give yourself up to despair and, and want to say, uh, I'm about to be shaken away from my foundation. Why is he so shaken? Because he feels these things that we're talking about here today. Oh, but hallelujah. Now, here's the good news. A key change. Uh, the, the key of David, the, the opening up of truth and revelation, a transformation comes in this, in this scripture. This scripture reeks of the gospel. It, it prevails in the gospel. It, it shows what, uh, looking forward to what Jesus would do for David, we now look back at what Jesus has done for us and we see it, this, this, this shift, uh, the, the, this focus. Uh, look, at, look, at verse, look at verse five. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. Wow, he went from feeling like God had turned his face from him. Now he said, but I'm trusting in your steadfast love, and my heart rejoices in your salvation. Oh, powerful word here. David is looking forward to the cross, looking forward to what Jesus would do for him, not knowing actually the name of, of a cross or of Jesus, but knowing that a Messiah, a Redeemer was coming, and he would know that he could be saved, saved from this condition of 
loneliness, save from this how long question, save from his own counsel, save from his enemies, even the self-enemy, Satan as an enemy, evil prevailing around him as, a, as an enemy. He would rejoice in his God's salvation. As he says, not my salvation, but your salvation. In other words, somebody was doing a saving. It wasn't his own self. He wasn't just straightening up his spine or pulling up his bootstraps and saying, I can get through this. I can, I'm a strong man. No, he's saying it's your salvation. That's what's turned my heart around. Now I have joy. Now I have steadfast love. And he closes by saying, and I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt with me bountifully. Now he's trusting. Now he's feeling deeply. He's, he's moving from shaken to steadfast. Uh, he's, he's moving from forgotten to being Love, <coughs> excuse me, being loved deeply by God. He's he's singing to the Lord. He's he, he's singing a new song. He, he's say, saying that God has dealt bountifully with me. It's not like he's diminished and abandoned and forgotten and turned his face from me. Now it's bountiful. Do you see that word bounty? It's it's wide. It's deep. It's it's eternal and it's utter. Oh, he's he he has seen a major shift. And I know you want that shift in your life, don't you? You don't want to be a person stuck in the how long season, in, in, in your own counsel season and feeling alone and hidden. You don't want to be stuck in that sorrow of your heart all day long. You don't want your enemy to triumph over you. There has to be a transition. But I want to ask this key question here. Where did this key change come from? How, how did he turn from verse 1 and 2 and 4 to, to, to understanding verse 5 and 6? Well, the only verse I didn't cover in this text so far is verse 3. And this is the key. This is the key change verse. This is the thing that turned him from sorrow into salvation. Look at it, verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He started off by saying, it, "If left to me, I sleep the sleep of death. Left to me, that's where I'm headed. The trajectory of my own counsel leads me to a dark place. But, so I ask you to light up my eyes. Let me see salvation. Let me see the joy of the Lord. Let me see what a new song would be like. Let me see what a, a, a faith and confidence in you. Let me see what fortitude and, and faithfulness would look like even when I don't feel your presence. Light up my eyes to see even in darkness that you were there. Even in my most horrible circumstance, there's the light of the glory of God shining his face upon me. Shine your face upon me and let my eyes reflect that and see the glory of the Lord. Consider and answer me. So he's praying. He's asking God something now. He's not, you see the reverse here? From taking his own counsel, from wallowing in his own despair, to now saying, I am going to call upon the name of the Lord. My hope is calling upon the name of the Lord. My solution is calling upon the name of the Lord. The key change in my life is calling upon the name of the Lord. Oh, this sounds simplistic, I know. Oh, this sounds too, too easy to be true, too good to be true. Oh, I just call upon the name of the Lord? Absolutely. You don't need to get complex. You don't need a, a, a master's or a PhD in theology to understand God loves the cry of the broken heart. He hears from heaven. He bends himself to care, to caress, to pick you up, to do new things in your life, to refresh you, to lighten your eyes in the midst of a dark hour and dark season. <laughs> Praise God. He just says, come and consider me. Oh, then, then I would say to you that the kind of sorrow that David's talking about there in this chapter can only be handled on his knees. The kind of sorrow and and senses of abandonment and circumstances you are in your life can only be handled on your knees. It's not just that it's the easy solution, it's the only solution. Your, your cleverness will never get you out of your mess. It's only the call of God to come and call upon his name. Consider and answer me, light up my eyes. Oh, this is, this is powerful, profound. He's now uh, asking God to do something. This word consider means look. Look in this direction, God. Uh, uh, I want you to do something in my eyes to lighten them, but first I have to have your countenance, your glory. Like when the disciples saw Jesus and he was transfigured before them and there was a brilliance on him. Was, uh, could you imagine being in a dark night and seeing that kind of light? It would hurt your eyes. And that's what's happening here. His eyes are having to adjust now. Look, and then he says to consider, or that word can also mean uh, to respond to this or, or to speak. The, the word look could mean scrutinize. So he's saying, what Isaiah 63, 15 says, look down from heaven and see 
Where, where are your zeal and your might, your tenderness and your compassion? He's asking, look and bring those things. Answer, give light, the light of, of this thing that, that Isaiah 63 says, your zeal, your might, your tenderness and your compassion. One of them is the, the omnipotence of God, the strength, but the other is the mercy and the kindness and the love of God. And he brings those two things. They're married in Christ and brought to fullness into your life. Once we begin to call upon the name of the Lord, uh, letting him scrutinize the situation and the circumstances so that we, we don't get stuck then in our own anxious conditions or our own sense of counsel, and there is a newness of life. Please let me take a few more minutes with you and see this same situation in, through the lens of the New Testament. And it's found in the book of Ephesians. And there are such close parallels to what Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, to what David writes. David is looking forward to what Paul sees. Paul sees it described backwards. David was looking forward to this. But here's what, here's what Paul sees. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. There it is. Lord, light my eyes. Look down. Consider Give me your power, give me your mercy. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope. You see, the, David starts off hopeless. How long will I be in this hopeless condition? But, but now he's having his eyes enlightened to the work and power and glory and goodness and strength of God. And he's saying, oh, now, now that my eyes are open, what are they open to? They're open to hope. That's what God wants to do through this message today, opening your eyes to hope. I don't want you to leave off the last of this message without saying, I'm leaving this message now having hope. Not by circumstances, but hope in God. By calling on his name, I have new hope now that he's coming, that he's hearing, that he's answering, to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the measurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, not who are in our own counsel, but we believe that God, and this is according to the working of his great might here, having the eyes, the, 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 the root word of this word eyes here is, is P-H-O-S. It's where we get the word a photograph from to, to see a new picture, <clears throat> to see something new laid out before it. And it, listen to this, this is good. I don't, I don't get into the Greek a whole lot. I'm not a scholar, but as I was reading this, it just brought such joy to my heart. In the Greek, this word, <clears throat> having your eyes enlightened, means it's, it's, in a, it's what's called a perfect tense. And that means it's occurred in the past, but which produces a state of being or a result that exists in the present. So it's, that's, it's something that God has already done for you. He, is, he has already enlightened you. If you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were enlightened, but it's a present, a perfect tense of saying it's, it's existing also in the presence. It's also what in the Greek they have these words, and this word is called. It's a this word is also not only perfect tense, but it's a path, a passive perfect tense. I don't want to get too complicated here, but let me give you the definition, and it might make you want to shout for joy. The subject is being acted upon. The subject is the receiver, and so I'm not trying to lighten my own eyes. I'm not trying to look. That's what the world offers us: is like try to have a better outlook, try to have a better perspective on things. Uh, see the glass half full and not empty. It's, it's your own energy, your own strength, trying to see things through a new way. This is being acted upon by the Holy Spirit in your life, my life. This is something you can't do in your own strength, in your own counsel. This is something that God has done and is continuing to do in your life. So in conclusion, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what you, you feel, no matter the troubles you have in your own counsel, call upon the name of the Lord and you will receive a life-transforming key change in your life. This act of calling upon the Lord shifts the things away from darkness and into light. You see a brighter future even in the midst of a darker day. Nothing speaks here of circumstantial change, but of a mental, emotional change physical and spiritual change. It's an internal change that starts. And oftentimes, how many of us know this, that once things change in our heart, it seems to change the environment and the circumstances around us. A person stuck in despair will find despairing circumstances. A person who's now receiving this worked upon, acted upon grace of God to be enlightened 
oftentimes brings a greater light, transformation to society, to culture, to family. It, it is it is salvation over enemies. It's salvation over fears. It's salvation over doubts. It's salvation over anxiety. It's salvation over being shaken from your faith so that you can stand strong. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear. You don't have to listen to those voices. You can begin to sing. You can begin to rejoice. You can begin to, to laugh again because the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Praise God. I pray that you would see this as a key change for your life. And I want to close by praying that over you. Father, let this word be like a key that opens up the mind's heart and eyes to see the revelation of your glory, that it is, it is something we are being acted upon. It's being acted upon us. We, we would love to see things, not through a how long will we be stuck, abandoned, but we want to see things through now, the lens of, oh, you're there, even in my darkest hour, you're present to me. You're, you're acting upon me, uh, a quickening of my mortal bodies, of my mind, of, of a, you're bringing a refreshing to me. And I thank you for that, Lord. And we do also pray for a circumstantial change for the, for, the, for the woman who feels abandoned by her husband, for the children who feel abandoned by their parents, for the, for the person who feels lonely. Lord, we thank you that you can also not only work, you, you can not only work, you work not only an internal change, but you can work an external circumstantial change as well. And we are not ashamed to pray over that, Lord. Heal broken relationships, heal father and and daughter and son, mother, daughter and son, husband and wife, family, church, uh, church situations that are near, bringing churches to near collapse. Pray you'd heal them. Let there be humility to see things not in their own counsel, but in the light that is being acted upon them to see through a new lens. And let there be resolution to all kinds of circumstantial difficulties. But most of all, we thank you for there being a key change in our heart that we can sing a new song and we can have joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless.